morning we come to the conclusion of John's gospel in chapter 21. So if you would turn with me there. I say conclusion in a sense. The book concluded last week in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. This morning, uh, as we do this, we are seeing that John is 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 putting a close and has put a close really to the account of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. And I'll say this several times this morning, so I'm going to say it up front and I'm going to say it again, again and again, is that though the book be closed, the gospel continues. The gospel of Jesus Christ continues in our lives. The love of God continues to pursue those whom he's called out of the world. So first what we'll do this morning is we will pray for the Lord to reveal uh, the scriptures to us. Then we will read the entirety of the text. Then we'll examine the details of the passage and make some observations and applications as we go. So would you join me in prayer, please? Well, Father in heaven, reveal to us your son through our study this morning. Give us grace to reveal the Lord Jesus and his love for us afresh this morning. I ask God for your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds that we might understand, inflame our hearts in love for God, we ask, Lord, for grace that you might move our will to obedience. We pray for the gathered church here and throughout our region this morning. We pray for the church that gathers at Baker Creek. Father, I ask that you would anoint the teaching of Pastor Dax, that the Lord Jesus would be clearly revealed to those who gather there. We pray for our brothers and our sisters who are providentially hindered this morning from, from being with us. May you minister to them through their prayers and devotion in your word this week. We pray for those who are neglecting to gather for whatever reason. We pray for the Spirit to correct them and to assure them that the body of believers needs them to be strengthened by their presence among us. We ask, Lord, that you would have your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if you are able, would you stand as we read John chapter 21? After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he re revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards off. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, 
Do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following him, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is it to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did where every one of them to be written. I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. This is God's word. Y'all may be seated. We've come to the end of the book, but not the end of the gospel. John seemingly has settled the account of Jesus Christ when we ended our study in John 20 last week. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you would have life in his name. I was thinking as I was studying this passage this week back in my youth ministry days, there was a student who was just about ready to age out of our program and he came to me after the message and he said, Jeff, when are you going to move past the gospel? He said, you've taught us from all over the Bible, and yet you continually, continually point everything back to Jesus and his death and resurrection. And I said, well, you know, I will no longer preach the, the, the gospel from any text when we no longer need its life-giving force. As soon as we uh, no longer need to be reminded of God's great love for us, I'll abandon the gospel when, we need, when that happens. When we no longer need a reminder of just how much our sin costs, then I'll abandon uh, the gospel. You know, maybe I'll uh, abandon it only then. And you know when? When I am in His presence forever in his presence forever. The gospel of Jesus Christ is all that we need every day. Every day we need to be reminded of just how much we are loved. We need to be reminded of just what sin costs. We need to be reminded of, as we sang uh, this morning, that before I even spoke a word, before I spoke, here's the thing, God initiated love in singing songs over the people that he chose. He sings songs over us. Isn't that amazing? That he loves us that much. So, if you're thinking to yourself this morning, Jeff, when will you ever move beyond the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'll tell you, never. Okay, never. Never. I will always preach Christ and Him crucified because I need it. And I know for a fact that you need it. I know for a fact 
Where you're sitting at today, I don't know exactly where you're at, but I know that there's places in your heart right now where you say, I am not 100% sure that God loves me through this. I'm not so sure that the things I've stepped in this week are forgiven. That's why every Lord's Day we want to remind you and remind ourselves, right, that God loves you and he's relentlessly pursuing you to change you, to transform you, to assure you of this great salvation that only he accomplished. The end of the account is complete. Jesus did all kinds of signs. He's done many. And the book are, are closed, and, but, but there are so many more. And these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You see, the gospel continues because you need to understand this, that you who were dead have been made alive by Christ and his death, and he loves you. And that right now today, he wants you to live but not live just as the world does. It exists. He wants you to live, to really live, to live in love and joy and hope. So the gospel of Jesus Christ continues. And here we have the good news of Jesus self-revealing restorative love. And it continues. And it continues without end for those who are called. Those who are the called according to his purpose. Now you probably know that most preachers, they want to give you the nugget of the passage later. They kind of want to, you know, build up to it and then get to a point in the, in the sermon when they feel like they've sufficiently set it up and then lead you to the treasure. But I want to give you the treasure right away this morning. I want to give you the treasure first. And we already had the treasure in, in the songs we sang, I think. The lyrics of those songs declared the treasure. But this is the treasure. That there is no dis distance. That you can have traveled where you're too far away. Where Jesus' love will not come and actively pursue you. There is no failure of faith on your part that will hinder Jesus Christ from revealing his great love to you. His love for you is not predicated on your success. You get that, brothers? Man, I'll tell you what. I lived a lot of years thinking that the love of Christ was predicated on me doing well. On me being faithful. It's the times when I was unfaithful that God assured me of his great love for me. In my brokenness, he said, I love you. I surrendered myself for you. This sin has been paid for. Remember that. Remember that. There is no thing, no success, no failure that, that God is not actively pursuing you. See, the love of God sent Jesus Christ, and he was the light of men, and that by believing that you would have life in his name. Jesus, in his love, res relentlessly continues to reveal himself to those he's chosen. I want you to keep in mind that as we look at this, the epilogue, the end of the story, that in the prologue, of John's gospel, he kind of continues this on here at the end. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Could you imagine putting yourself in Peter's shoes, having denied the Lord Jesus three times? What an overwhelming feeling, I believe, of shame, worthlessness, thinking you're out of the game forever. I'm out of the game. My brothers are moving on. My brothers were faithful. John beat me to the tomb. John did everything first. John stayed at the cross. And here I am, a failure. One who constantly denied Christ three times. I don't even know the man. Trying to diso I disassociated myself from Christ. But that darkness cannot overcome the light of Christ. 
and Christ is our overcoming Savior. And, and Christ, for those whom he has called, he is relentlessly pursuing them. Let us look a little more closely at the first eight verses here again. I will read it again. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter, Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, and they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards off. Jesus has revealed himself alive. Three days in a tomb. The angels testified that Jesus is risen. Jesus showed himself to the women. Mary testified that she had seen the Lord. Jesus revealed himself, transformed as he showed himself to the disciples minus Thomas behind a locked door. And then he revealed himself a second time behind the locked door of the disciples hideout with Thomas included amongst them. Our passage begins with Jesus meeting with seven of his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. We should notice that the disciples have turned to, returned to familiar ground. They've returned to their familiar pursuits. Some have, I think, erroneously looked at this passage and said that this was sinful in that they have returned to fishing. Jesus, in fact, told them to wait. Go to Galilee and wait. Aren't we waiting on the Lord right now? Aren't we occupied with many things while we wait? So they go and they're occupied their time as they wait upon the Lord and they go fishing. So here they are, they've gone fishing and the shepherd, he had been struck and the sheep then they have scattered. What did these seven disciples who are here in this moment have in common? Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, John, Andrew, and Philip are those who were at the beginning with Christ in the beginning of John's gospel. And Christ shows us here that he preserves and that he perseveres with all those whom he has called. He is with us. He is the gospel is not only that which initiates salvation, but it is that which carries us through all the way. Secondly, these who had gathered here to fish, they had witnessed the risen Christ. What draw them, drew them together to remain in fellowship one with another, to remain friends, to may, remain occupied in the same thing? They were bonded together because they had witnessed the risen Christ. You see, church, uh, it is, it is made up of those that are not necessarily have a shared affinity, right? If a shared affinity was all that we needed to call ourselves the church, we could be, I don't know, we could be Kiwanis. We could be a motorcycle club because we have a shared affinity and that's why we get together. What we have is that we are those who testify that Jesus Christ is alive, right? That's what we have. That's what bonds us together. We come together on the Lord's day and we declare our Christ, our God is risen. He is alive. Our God loves us. Our God wants to be in our presence and with us. We declare Christ risen and that is what brings us together. The assembled church gathers as a witness to the living Christ, even though we may have nothing else in common. 
You can look across the room and go, I don't know anything about that guy or that gal. And, I, and the things that I do know about them, I'm not part of that. I don't participate in that. Other than Jesus Christ and Him risen from the dead, I have nothing in common with, with that person over there, but I have the whole world in common with Him. Because He, like me, has been saved by the love of God in Christ Jesus, and He confesses the same thing I do, that Christ Jesus is alive. That's what we have in common. That's what brings the church together. Well, Peter and Thomas being mentioned here as the, the first names in this text should have some significance to us, I think. Thomas was a rank unbeliever who vehemently said, I refuse to believe the testimony of my brothers. I refuse to believe the women or the angels. Remember just a few verses back in chapter 20. I will not believe unless... They've all testified that Jesus is alive. I will not believe unless. And then we have Peter and his known denial of Christ, prone to pridefully declaring his allegiance to Christ and yet three times denying that he even knows him in public. Not only should we know that the church is made up of those who are witnesses to the truth of Christ's resurrection from the dead, but the truth is that the church is comprised of us who are doubters, deniers, and sinners of every single stripe. We are full of people who, who have some proclivity, some propensity towards particular sins, and yet here we are, saved by grace in the love of God in Christ Jesus. The church is made up of all kinds of sinners. I remember we were talking the other day, me and another brother were talking about, you know, when you, when you gather in the church and then we, we start to sort of rub up against each other and we, we have issues with this person or that person. And you go, man, church would be so much easier if there weren't other people in it. Right? Our church would be so much easier if everybody sinned the same as me. Like if we had the same kind of sin, their sin wouldn't bother me, right? Because even those who commit the same kind of sins I do, right? As my wife often says, oh, you don't like that because uh, I don't like it when we don't like sin that we see in somebody else. My wife often says, oh, yeah, I don't like that because I think my sin looks really ugly on you. Like it looks uglier to me when you do it than when I do it, Right? Well, the church is made up uh, of, of all of those type of people. And every type of those people have been brought to faith by Christ because of God's love for us. Christ died in our stead. That's another commonality that the church has when we gather. Christ died for that brother whose sin annoys me. Christ died for my sin that annoys my sister. We have that in common as we gather. Well, the church gathers also because she is in really desperate need. I don't know about you guys, but when I travel my way here this, you know, each morning, I'm in the car, it's about nine and a half miles from my house. And I usually get in, I have the radio cranked on when I first get in. By the time I get kind of out of Carlton, I turn it off just to sit and listen. And then I realize, man, I need Jesus. I need to know his love for me. I need to be with his people who can empathize with my place. I need to be with people who are just as desperate as I am. I need to be in church. I need to be with my brothers and sisters. See, the church gathers because she has this great need. She needs to have the gospel preached to her again and again and again. She needs a reminder of just how far God's love would go in pursuing her. 
The church gathers because the love of God in Christ Jesus is still constantly pursuing us, continues to woo us. Christ continues to woo us. Did you know that? He is wooing you. I'm serious. He's wooing you. And you might be sitting there in, in, in a desperate place as maybe Peter was, thinking, I have failed him so many times. There's just no way. I'm, I, I've got to take myself out of the game and be on the sidelines. No, Christ is wooing you. Come to me. All you who are heavy laden, come to me. Lay your burden upon me. I have love to show you, love to give you. I am pursuing you relentlessly. And the church gathers because the light of Christ continues, is, is the way that we continue to have the path of our lives illuminated in a dark world, isn't it? Like when we look at the world and the things that are going on in it, it is a dark, dark place. And I know when I come into church and I come and I hear the word of God and I sing songs that just glorify him, I say, oh, there's the light. There's the light. That's what will illuminate my path as I leave here and go six days in the midst of ugly, ugly darkness. I know what I need. I need that light of Jesus Christ to illuminate my path. I need to see clearly. Though the canon of Scripture is closed, you see, Jesus continues revealing his love to you. The canon is closed, but the story of God's love in Christ's death and resurrection continues to be written. The love of Christ continues to be written. Where is he writing it? Not in a book. He's writing it on your own heart. God is continuing to write the truth of the gospel in your life as he continues to pursue you, to transform you, to change you. Jesus reveals himself to these guys after a night of fishing, and he says, children, have you any fish? In verse five. In common terms, this language is really more endearing. He refers to them like young lads. Hey, lad, how'd you fare? Have your efforts paid off? Are you satisfied with the work of your hands? Are you satisfied? And they say, no. The Spirit of Christ prompts us sometimes with these very questions, doesn't it? Do we ever, do we recognize that we have the failure of our flesh-driven efforts. Have we hungered for the things of the world and then we find them not satisfying? Is your great need being met through your own efforts? Do you see your need? Do you recognize that you need to be reminded of the good news of Christ's electing love for you? Children, have you had any fish? Are you satisfied? Is this going to satisfy you? Verse 6. <clears throat> he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other, other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they are not far from the land, about 100 yards off. Jesus says, cast your net on the right side, and you will find some. See, Jesus gives a command. If you obey my instructions, it is there in which you will find success. Are you sitting here this morning painfully aware of your own emptiness? Painfully aware of your own failure? Perhaps this morning the Spirit of Jesus Christ is saying to you, 
I have something for you to do. I have a way in which I want you to do it. I want you to stop what you are doing and I want you to listen to me and do as I have commanded you. Notice that through their obedience to Jesus' command, Jesus says to Peter, it is the Lord. They obey the command of Christ and then he reveals himself to them. And he says, it is the Lord. Through obedience to Christ's command, Jesus gives them an abundant harvest. He gives them his presence and obviously something of his nature is revealed to them. You might recall the connection between fishing and evangelism. Remember another great catch that was in Luke's gospel in chapter 5. Peter says, at your word, the nets, they are full and they're full to the breaking point. The miracle caused Peter to say, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. They obey, he obeys Christ, right? He casts the net where he tells him to and, and then Something of who Christ is is revealed to him in that moment of his obedience. I did what you said at your word. I cast it. And then there was this abundant harvest. And then Jesus revealed to him, says, depart from me. I am a sinful man. This is the Lord God. Obedience to Christ's command comes with a blessing. And it comes with the revelation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. At the end of that passage, of this passage, of that passage, Jesus says, from now on, you will be fishers of men. I wonder, church, if we are dissatisfied with the results of our evangelism. Are the nets full? Is the church of Jesus Christ expanding in Yam Hill or Washington County? Maybe God is asking us to stop what we're doing. Listen to his commands. Do evangelism his way. And perhaps the nets would be full. And in it, if the nets don't get full this week, this month, this year, but yet we are obeying the commands of Christ, at the, at the very least, Christ will give us a fresh revelation of himself. Perhaps, if we want a fresh revelation of his atoning love for us, perhaps, maybe, God's saying, I have something for you to do, do it my way. Perhaps we might begin by obeying what he commands. Verse 9. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went, went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So here we have Jesus' self-revelation for the third time to his disciples. And he comes in love to remind them, to restore them. And notice that he comes still as a servant to them. As they get to the shore, he's already got fish and bread prepared. He's got a fire started. He comes to serve them. And, and he also knows this, that as he comes, not one of them is lost. Not one of them is unreconcilable. To the, devour, to the doubters, to the deniers, to the disobedient, Christ continues to love, continues to restore, and he continues to serve. We come to a redeeming charcoal fire. Here's the second time we see a charcoal fire, isn't it? Do you remember the first fire? In the first fire, Peter associates himself with the people of the world and he warms himself 
and he takes comfort with them while he denies his connection to Jesus, and he's in the courtyard of the high priest. In John 18, 17 and 18 says this, the servant girl, girl at the door said to Peter, you are also not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. So here is the next charcoal fire that Jesus has prepared for them. And he invites them, come and receive the blessing of your obedience. The harvest is plentiful. Obedient workers, they are few. Bring the harvest. As you serve me by obeying my commands, I remind you not of your failure. See, isn't that awesome? As they come, he doesn't remind them of their failure. Because every one of us as disciples of Jesus Christ have failed him. But when Jesus is there and he's got the fire and he's, bring what you've harvested. Bring the blessing of your obedience. Bring that. I'm not reminding you of your failure. I'm showing you that through faith in me and trust in me, there's success. There's success. Bring that success that you've done in me. Bring that. I remind you not of your failure, but that my commands to you, they are not burdensome. In fact, it is my pleasure to serve you with the reward of the work that can only be done through me. The gospel of Jesus Christ continues to be good news for us, church. It continues to be good news. It is in continued faith and obedience to the commands of Christ that the risen Christ continues to be present with us. He continues to reveal himself to us. He continues to bless us with a participation with him in the rewards of his death and resurrection. He continues in love, not reminding us of our failures. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He has said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. In the courtyard of the high priest, warming himself by a charcoal fire, the gospel of John records, Peter's threefold failure. But in our passage here, the great high priest, the greater than Caiaphas, Jesus is unwilling to leave Peter in a place of shame and doubt. Jesus' love pursues Peter and restores him in a threefold measure of grace. See, the great high priest, the great high priest, was there by that fire. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Jesus' first question to him do you love me more than these? This is a question that probes Peter to evaluate his heart. To assess the transforming work of Christ's love for him. You might recall Peter's boastful stance in Matthew 26. Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. See, in that statement, he's saying... Even though those guys are all failures, I will never, ever fail. I will not fail. Though 
it, is, it would be deemed wrong to be with you. I will never deny you. I will never fall, fall away. And he says, would you still say, Peter, that you love me more than them? Would you still say that? Are you still willing to say that you love me more than these? But as Jesus asked this question, he says, do you love me as I have loved you with an agape love? And think about this idea. I want to paint a picture like agape love at 100% and phileo love at, say, 60%, just to give us numbers to think about. Do you love me in the way that I love you, Peter, with a love that endures all things, with a love that uh, endures no matter how much it costs? But Peter's answer is humble here. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I love you with a phileo love. I love you with brotherly affection. You know that as in as much as a man can love another, I love you. Peter now admits the frailty of his human capacity, the fickleness of his human heart. And he says, in all humi humility here, he says, you know that I love you, but I am a sinner saved by grace. Not counting his first denial against Peter, Jesus commissions him, feed my lambs. And a second time, do you love me? Do you love me with the love that I loved you? With agape, 100% love. Peter says, you know me, Lord. You know that I am a sinner who loves you with a phileo love. I know you love me 100%. I love you with all I have, but it's about 60% compared to your love for me. I know your love is greater. I love you, but your love is greater. Not counting Peter's second denial again against him. He restores him and he restores his failure and he commissions him. He says, tend my sheep. And a third time, he brings the full restoration of Peter's denial when he asks, do you love me? Do you love me? A hundred percent agape love, Peter, as I have loved you. And Peter's grieved. Lord, you know everything. What does he know? Lord, you know everything. You know my propensity to make rash decisions. You know my tendency to be a hothead. You know that I have residual sin in my heart. Yes, I love you. A love that pales in comparison to your love for me. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Do you know the length that God will go to redeem you because of his love? See, God so loves Matt O'Kane that he sent his only begotten son to die for him, that he might have eternal life. Do you know a love that will continue to pursue you? Do you know a love that is continuing to transform every failure from your past? A love that is pursuing you right now to restore you who have abandoned kingdom purposes, to restore you to those purposes for failures that you have committed, even the ones you committed on the way here this morning? Do you know that God is pursuing you in love? He's saying, I love you, brother. I love you, sister. I have so much more for you. I want to restore you. I want to redeem you. I want to renew you. Right now, do you know a love that would leave the 99? Do you know that kind of love that would leave the 99 and pursue you, the one who is prone to wander away? This kind of love has a name. And his name is Jesus. I kept thinking of the song that we sang just a couple weeks ago, before the throne of God above, you have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Just like Hebrews says, 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and yet he is without sin. Let us then with confidence, with confidence, draw near the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Do you know that your great need right now all of us, I, I would say all of us, I think I can boldly say all of us, our great need right now is to know that God loves you. That God loves you and me, a sinner. He loves us. He pursues us. He's not willing to leave us in whatever place we're in right now. And I bet that each one of you can think of ways in which you go, man, I, I want to go this far with the Lord. I want to go farther with the Lord, but I haven't and I failed. Jesus in love wants to take you there. He wants to transform you and take you to those places. He doesn't want to remind you of your failure. He says, just stop what you're doing. Cast your net on the right side or wherever it is that I tell you. It could have been the left. It doesn't matter. Jesus commanded it. You should do it. Just do what I tell you to do. I will bring in the harvest. I will bring it in. And I will share my inheritance with you because I love you. Jesus says to Peter, I pursued you in my love Jesus says, I pursue you. I love you. I've restored you in my love. And now I have work for you to do. He says, think about this. Tend my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. He says, I've pursued you in love. I've restored you in my love. And now I have a work for you to do, Peter. Love those who belong to me. What a great thing, right? The guy who thinks he's a total failure can never be used of the Lord again. And he says, I love you. I've got work for you to do. Care for my flock. Feed them my word. Relentlessly pursue their redemption just as I've done for you. Relentlessly seek to love them. Lovingly restore them. When they fail, lovingly go to them and say, say to them, you are, you are a son or a daughter of Christ. And he wants you to know that you are loved. He wants you to know that he doesn't want you to remain there. Peter, feed my lambs. Care for those whom I love. Love them in the way that I loved. And then you wonder, I hope you do, as I did, my brain went to, did Peter really? Then from this point forward, listen and obey the commands of Christ to love his people. Listen to what he says uh, to other under shepherds in his later days in 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, compulsion but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful, shameful gain, but eagerly, not dominating over those uh, in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. See, Peter here is humbled by Christ's loving pursuit of himself. And Peter encourages other under shepherds to tenderly and humbly pursue those who are of Christ's flock. And now, the seeming, after this love, this restoration, when we look at verse 18, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said by show what kind of death he was to glorify God. 
Jesus reminds Peter, count the cost. You will be called to suffer many things for the glory of God. The loss of dignity, the loss of freedom, possibly the loss of life. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turns and he sees the, the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Think about that. See, he tells him what the cost is going to be. And then I see here that there's an evident need in Peter's life for the continuing work of the gospel. When told how much following Christ will cost, cost him, Peter's response is, what about this guy? What about him? You're telling me that in my obedience, it's going to cost me imprisonment. It's going to cost me my freedom. It's going to cost me my very life. What about this guy? See, there's an evident need in Peter's life for the gospel, gospel to continue to work those things out. See, he might be saying, is he somehow a better disciple than I am? If his service doesn't cost as much as mine, is that somehow an indication that John's disciple, uh, discipleship is, 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 is much better than mine, that his ministry is better than mine? He's not called to suffer. I'm called to suffer. What about him? That means that mine must be somewhat lesser, right? If I have to suffer to the point of death and imprisonment and his doesn't, God, you favor him more. You love him more, perhaps. Peter, you will have enough trouble serving God in the way that I call you, is basically what Jesus says. Peter, you're going to have enough trouble serving God in the way that I call you to, to be concerned about the service of another. As for you, follow me. As for you, follow me. For us, we need the gospel to remind us that we serve the Lord right where we are. You know, as I was hearing Josh and the guys sing this morning, and there was a time years ago when I would say, man, I covet the guy who can get up there and sing so well. I can't do that. If I could perhaps have what they have, then my ministry would be so much better. And I even grumbled at the Lord at times. Why don't I have that? Why don't I have that? Can you still possibly use me with what I have? Why don't I have that? Why have you given him favor? Do you love him more than me? Well, no. Jesus would remind me, as for you, son, follow me. The kind of service that I have called to you, you to do, do that. I remember backing up the trailer when we used to go to the school, you know, and I'm backing up the trailer and we've got all those chairs and we've got every, all the gear in there and we're unloading it. And I come one Sunday and I'm backing that trailer up and it has a big, huge dent in the right fender well. And my brother-in-law, who loves me, he's there and he's unloading it and he looks at it and he sees the big dent. And he looks at it and he says... Jeff, I want to remind you, do what you do well, and this isn't one of them, <laughs> right? I have enough to do to follow Jesus with what he's given me, right? And all of us do. <clears throat> God uses... Uh, different people in different ways. Old guys like me, we can't begrudge the young man who enthousi enthusiastically serves the Lord in a way that is contrary to the way that now I, in my old age, have become much more reserved as I age. I find that year after year, I become a little bit more reserved, right? And when I see a young guy who's enthusiastic, I'm like, man, temper that down a little bit, right? Like, take that down. That's just too much for me. You know, you have to, but the Lord uses that and I can't begrudge the young man who has that enthusiasm for the Lord to serve in that way. 
right? Uh, I can't be jealous of another service that seems more pleasant than what the Lord has called me to, right? You know, doing ministry in hard places, they say, right? It, it seems like when you, when you go into a, 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 a population uh, that is more an affluent sort of neighborhood, right, and those kind of things, you can, you can kind of plant a church there and, and immediately have two or 300 people there. Whether you're doing any good or not, you know, and, and we can kind of look at that, you know, in these, in these rural places and look at that and, and envy it and go, well, why don't we have two or three? That's not the ministry I called you to. That's not the kind of ministry I called you to. I called you to this. Grow where I've called you. Don't be looking at the service of another. It is enough for you. Just follow me, Jesus would say. Right where you are. God uses different temperaments to glorify Him, doesn't He? We will endure different hardships for sure, but one thing remains for all of us. God, on His part, will continue to love, restore, reform, and conform us. For our part, we are called to follow Jesus. For that, we need an instruction from God's Word, don't we? We need an ever-growing revelation of the nature and character of God's Christ. And that is revealed to us in the scripture. When God wants to restore us, he asks for a simple response from these guys, and he asks it the same one from us. Trust and obey. Trust that I love you and obey what I command you. Do you desire the kingdom of God and the blessings of eternal life with Jesus Christ? I would say trust in his refining love for you. Trust in the continuing gospel of Jesus Christ. Ask for the grace of God to work in us, obedience and faith. I would say if you want to participate in the kingdom of God, gather with the saints continually. Continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Be those who are steadfast in prayer. Count the cost, but follow Jesus. I think you need to count the cost, but count the reward too. You count the cost. Yes, it's going to cost you everything in this life. But you're going to experience a love that is unlike any other in the world, right? Nobody will love you in the way that Christ has loved you. The testimony of John, the apostle, is complete. And he tells us here that this testimony can be uh, trusted. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. The testimony is complete. The testimony is to be trusted. The book is closed, but that's not the end of the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This end is where we begin. I think that this end of this book is where we should look at ourselves and say, this is where I begin. I know that God loves me and sent his son and is continuing to woo me in that love day after day after day. I begin today to place my trust in that love and do what he says. We do that when we raise our kids, right? We want our kids, we want our kids. Why do we want them to obey? Well, you know, you've heard parents say, do what I say. Why? Because I said so. No. Do what I say because you know that I love you. You know that I, I want absolutely what is best for you. If you do what I say, there's blessing. I want you to have blessing. I don't want you to do what I say just because I said it. Do what I say because I love you. Because you can trust that I love you. I used to remember my son when he was like 12. Every single thing I told him to do, his answer was exactly the same. Why? And so I told him after some time, you know, son, my least favorite word in the whole American language is why. And so you know what he says, right? Why? 
Because why communicates to me that you do not trust my love for you? When I give you an instruction, your why says, Dad, I don't trust that you love me enough to guide me in the right way. That's why I disliked that word so much. The love of God will continue to pursue even you. Even you who are prone to wander, even you who are cowardly in your testimony uh, of God's gospel, even you who are stubborn in your faith, even you who are now hanging your head in shame, I want you to know this, that you are loved. And do you know that? He laid his life down for you. I'm asking you this morning, will you respond to Christ? And if you've already responded to him in faith, know this, that if you're wandering away from him, his love is coming after you. It's coming after you. And it may come when you least expect it. And his command is simple. The response to his love is simple. Do what I've commanded you because I love you. I have what's best for you. And follow me.